Good morning, everyone. Morning. Nice to be here, isn't it? Yes. Well, you can guess who, who won the uh, discussion last night about who would preach. You see, I'm staying in his home, so I'm at his mercy. And uh, he, he basically said in so many words, if you'd like to have a warm home tonight, dry, you will preach tomorrow. Now, he didn't say it exactly like that, but he might as well have. <laughs> he actually said something like this, the Lord told me that you're supposed to preach tomorrow. And he told me that he would tell you later. <laughs> you know, that's the classic line that uh, the young man uses to win that young lady in the, uh, in the youth group. You know, he's, he has a fancy for her and he thinks she might be the one. And so he says, you know, the Lord told me you're the one I'm going to marry. And he told me he would tell you later. <laughs> thank you, Jason. It's a privilege to be here this morning. I thank you for your patience. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, happy Sabbath. Isn't it glorious to be in the Lord's house on the Lord's day, studying from the Lord's Word? Amen. Amen. Our message this morning is entitled, Revelation's Bride. Revelation's Bride, and it will be part of the continuous series of the 11th Hour Evidence. Now, before we get into the message proper, though, what will be our custom? To pray. So let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we come to you just now, and we thank you for this glorious Sabbath morning. Father, it is warming up and the buds are preparing to bloom and, and it is a beautiful time here, spring. And Father, spring reminds us of that rejuvenation and regeneration that we experience in Christ. Please, Father, now as we open your word, we pray that you will condescend to come into this room in the person of your spirit. You have promised that you would send the spirit of truth to lead us into all truth. And so, Father, we are asking that you will do that just now. Father, we pray that as we try to uncover and to discover this powerful message about the Bride of Christ, we pray that your Spirit will teach us, not because of a man, but in spite of a man. May my words today be thy words, is my prayer in Jesus' name. And everyone can say, Amen. Amen. Well, let's begin by going to Revelation chapter 12. And our message is entitled, Revelation's Bride. Revelation, what chapter are we going to? Twelve. Now, Jason said something that's actually very powerful and very true in his introduction. He said, the church is the bride of Christ. Let me ask you a question this morning. Is that biblical? I said, is that biblical? That is biblical, isn't it? Revelation chapter 12. And beginning in verse 1, we find here John there uh, riding on the lonely island of Patmos. I can imagine as he saw this powerful vision, the warmth that must have come over his heart as he realized that he was a member of the very bride that he was seeing in that prophetic vision. He says in Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, Now a great sign appeared where, everyone? In heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then she, being with child, cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Notice what this woman is adorned with, what she is clothed with. The sun and the moon and the what else, everyone? The stars. The sun, the moon, and the stars. These are the three things that God ordained in the creation week, Genesis 1, to bring light to a dark planet. When John saw there that woman in Revelation 12, in my mind's eye, I see John remembering Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 and 2. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Behold, darkness covers the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. God here depicts his beautiful bride, transcendent and iridescent in her glory, bringing light to a dying and darkened world. Can you say amen? amen? Now, in both the Old and the New Testament, it is common for God to refer to his church in a prophetic context or a symbolic context as a woman. We have that in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. And so it is very biblical and very theologically sound for us to affirm that this woman that John sees here in this eschatological prophecy is none other than the true church of Christ. I want to say that again. The true church of of Christ. The what church? The true church. Now, something very interesting happens right here within the context of the book of Revelation. And if we go just five chapters forward, we come to Revelation chapter 17. Go with me now to Revelation chapter 17. We have seen that first vision 
of that beautiful woman. And now we will note that there is a second, a second woman that appears. I'm in Revelation chapter 17. Then one of the angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot. The great what, everyone? Harlot, harlot or whore. Friends, that is not a pretty word. It's even a difficult word to say. The word means a, a prostitute, somebody who has had multiplied lovers who has not been faithful. Now notice what it says here. Uh, Come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings, notice plural, the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Fornication is sexual immorality. In this context, it's spiritual immorality. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. There it is again. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness, here it is again, of her fornication. Notice that emphasis there, fornication, fornication, fornication. What John is emphasizing in unequivocal language is that this woman is unfaithful. This woman is what, everyone? Now let's put what we've already learned together with that salient deduction. Listen carefully. What does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? A church. Now, if we have a faithful woman in Revelation chapter 12, that would represent a faithful church. And here, if we have an unfaithful woman, that would represent an unfaithful church. Now, notice as he goes on here in verse 5. And on her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Verse 7, But the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. Now, let's ask a few questions here. How many women have we been exposed to already this morning in Revelation? At least how many women have we been exposed to? No, you missed it. At least four. Now, why do I say four? Notice verse five again. When describing this woman, it says, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Now, if you have harlots, you put the S on the end in the English language, that means we're dealing with a plural or a multiplicity. That's right. So if, if she has harlot daughters, we have at least how many? At least two. And then we have the mother and then we have the faithful. Are you with me now? Yes or no? Now, I believe that the language that John is using here communicates that there's not just two, but it must be at least that. He sees multiplied daughters, numerous daughters of this mother. So we've already been introduced now in Revelation chapter 12 and 17 to at least four different women. Now, this raises a significant question. How many brides does Jesus have? Is Jesus a polygamist? Or is Jesus going to marry one bride? How many will he marry? One bride. Well, let's try and put this into a context here. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth, contrasted with that beautiful chaste woman that we saw in Revelation chapter 12. Now, how can this be? If Jesus is going to only marry one and he established just one, how can it be that when we come to Revelation, we find not one, but two, three, four, five, and an innumerable number of brides? Go with me in your Bible then to Matthew chapter 16. Let's see if we can set a context for this. Matthew chapter 16. We will come back to Revelation, but let's go now to the first book of the New Testament. From the last book to the first book of the New Testament, I'm in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew what chapter? 16. And a byproduct of our message tonight will answer this, this very important question that many people are asking, many non-Christians even are asking, and that is, why are there so many different Christian denominations? That will be a byproduct of our message, and you will see why that is the case from a biblical perspective and not just from an ecclesiological perspective. So we are now in Matthew chapter 16, and I'm quoting beginning in verse 18. Let's begin there. Jesus is speaking to Peter. Actually, let's back up. Let's pick it up in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Jesus is taking a public opinion survey. Verse 14, so they said, Some say John the Baptist, and some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus was satisfied that they had given him an accurate representation of the public opinion, and so he asks now a more pointed question in verse 15. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Who do what, everyone? You say that I am. Verse 16, Simon Peter speaks up on behalf of the rest and said, 
You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Was that the right answer, by the way? Yes or no? Yes. Notice verse 17. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Verse 18. <coughs> and I also say to you that you are Peter. You are what, everyone? Peter. Peter. Now, the word there is Petros. You are Petros, and the word means little rolling stone or a pebble. Or a what word, everyone? Pebble. A pebble. You are Petros. You are a little pebble. But notice what he goes on to say. And on this rock. Now, the word here rendered rock in the Greek language is Petra. Petra. Jesus is actually using a very powerful play on words. He says, you have answered correctly, Simon Peter, and I say unto you that you are Petros, little rolling stone, little pebble, but upon this Petra, large, monolithic, unmovable rock, I, notice what he will do, will build my, what's the next word? Church. Now you will notice that the word church there is in the singular. It is in the what, everyone? Singular, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Quick question here. According to Jesus' own words, how many churches did he establish on that Petra? How many, everyone? One. So if we could have asked Jesus, if we could have transported ourselves back to ancient Palestine and said, Jesus, how many churches will you build on the foundation of the Petra? He would say, I have established my church. My what, everyone? Church. church in the singular. Well, now this raises significant theological paradoxes and questions for us because if Jesus establishes a single church in the first book of the New Testament and then we come to the last book of the New Testament, we don't have a church, but we have multiple churches symbolized by women, this raises a, an important question. Where did all of these women come from? You with me now? Yes or no? Amen. Now let's notice another one, and this is in uh, the writings of Paul, the book of Ephesians. The book of what, everyone? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You'll find it right there. Uh, you'll have Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, then Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And the Apostle Paul here draws out some very sublime parallels between the relationship that a man and a woman have in the marital confines and the relationship that Christ has with his church. Notice that with me in Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll pick it up in verse 2. Hus wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, or verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the what? Church. Notice there in the singular. He is the head of the church. That is the singular definite article, the. Not the church is. That he is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as, notice it again, the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved, what are the next two words? the church, and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her. Notice not them. Sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Jump down, down, to, ver down to verse 31. For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother, and the two shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He's quoting from Genesis 2. Then in verse 32, he draws this very powerful and salient conclusion. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and what? The church. There is no escaping it, friends, that the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, in breaking down this relationship between a man and a woman as a microcosm of the relationship between Christ and his church, he refers to it consistently and repeatedly as the church, the church, the church, the church, in the singular. In the what, everyone? In the singular. Friends, Jesus is not a polygamist. <laughs> In the same way that one man has one wife, so to Christ as the second Adam will have one bride. Amen? Amen? So we're on the same page. Yet this raises significant questions about where did these other women come from in the book of Revelation? How can it be that these other women come? Well, notice that she was referred to as Mystery Babylon the Great. That word Babylon is pregnant with significance and we need to understand it. Go with me now to Genesis chapter 11. First book of the Bible, Genesis in the 11th chapter. Let's see if we can wrap our fingers around this idea of Babylon. We're going to Genesis chapter 11 and we're going to begin in verse 1. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 1. 
Now, I'm going to read through this passage quickly to set the context, so be sure you're following along, beginning in verse 1 of Genesis 11. Now, the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city. Let us build a city for who, everyone? ourselves and a tower whose top is in the heavens notice that they wanted to build a tower that would reach into heaven itself let us make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth verse 5 but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men built and the Lord said indeed the people are one and they have all one language and this is what they begin to do now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them verse 7 come let us go down let us confuse their what let us confuse their language, and they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they ceased building the city. Now notice verse 9. Verse 9 is sort of the theological conclusion from verses 1 through 8. Verse 9 says, Therefore its name is called what? Babel or Babel. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord, what's the next word? Confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. When the Bible uses in Revelation chapter 17 this phrase, Babylon the Great, this is a direct referent to that original place where we find Babel or Babylon, and that's in Genesis chapter 11. The flood was history. The flood was what, everyone? History. And God had said to the people, go, disperse yourselves, go out and, and replenish the earth and subdue it, much the same way that he had said to Adam in the Garden of Eden. But instead of going out and dispersing themselves, they decided to come to a central locality and to make for themselves a city. To make what, everyone? For themselves. And this city would have a tower, a tower so tall, so robust, so architecturally perfect with, with specificity and exactitude that it would reach all the way up into the highest of the high heavens. Now, some theologians have commented and commentators that the reason they were going to build this high tower was because they distrusted the word of God about the flood. He had said, I will never again destroy the earth with a flood. Now, there's an important point there. He did not say he would never again destroy the earth. What he said is, I'll never again destroy the earth, what? With a flood. And so the, the idea that some commentators have, and I think it's accurate, is that they were going to build this thing so tall that it would actually be outside of the reaches of a flood should one come again. In other words, friends, they were going to work by the sweat of their brow and by the ingenuity of their minds, and they were going to save themselves. You with me now? Yes or no? Yes. So what we find here Babylon symbolizing in its original usage in Scripture is two things. Number one, it is a center of confusion. And number two, it is a tribute to the works and edifices and artifice of man. Do you understand? Number one, a center of confusion. Number two, a tribute to man. Now go with me to Neo-Babylon in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4, we find a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. What's his name, everyone? Nebuchadnezzar. And you're probably familiar with Nebuchadnezzar from Daniel chapter 2. Now, I wish we had time to go into all of the details of Daniel chapter 4 because there is a sublime prophecy here that, that talks about Nebuchadnezzar and his downfall. He was stricken with a disease for seven years called lysanthropic insanity. He went out, he ate grass. And at the end of that time, he praised the Lord Jesus Christ because God had humbled him utterly. Notice why he needed to be humbled, though. I'm picking it up in verse 29. At the end of the 12 months, he was walking about in the royal palace of Babel, and that's Nebuchadnezzar. Now verse 30. The king spoke, saying, and the picture I have here in my mind is of Nebuchadnezzar sort of walking out under one of his verandas, looking out at the palatial and ostentatious display of ancient Babylon, which contained one of the seven wonders of the world, namely the great hanging garden. And as he's looking at this glory, he's looking at the golden city. That's what Isaiah referred to it as. He says this in verse 30. Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? Friends, Nebuchadnezzar's buttons were bursting as he looked out over his palatial kingdom, he was saying, this is Babylon, I have built it for my majesty and for my glory. So Babylon here comes to symbolize Neo-Babylon, a tribute to man, his excellence, his majesty, his expertise, edifice, and artifice. Are we together now, yes or no? Yeah. 
Now, when the Bible then refers in Revelation chapter 17 to this woman as mystery, Babel in the great, it's, it's communicating several very powerful biblical theological points. Now, let us continue as we move now into the, the meat of this message. Babylon then would symbolize a man-made system of religion. When it says there, mystery Babel in the great, it's a man-made system of religion, a religion that glorifies man and in which man saves himself. Doesn't need the grace of Jesus so much, we will work our way as they were going to work their way to the top of that ancient tower. Now, notice this incredible statement here on the screen. Go with me. This is taken from Wary's church history. It says, Christianity had now become popular. This is in the fourth century. A man by the name of Constantine. What was his name? Constantine, the first Roman emperor to profess Christianity. And he says, Christianity had now become popular. And a large proportion, perhaps a large majority of those who embraced it, only assumed the what? The name, they are as much heathen as they were before. Error and corruption now came in upon the church like a flood. What is, what is Wary describing here? Chiefly this. Remember that when Jesus established his single church, his what, everyone? Single church. Did that church grow rapidly? I said, did that church grow rapidly? You need to go read the book of Acts if you say no, friends. On the first day of Pentecost, how many were baptized? Three? Thirty? Three thousand. And then the Bible says just shortly thereafter, 4,000 were baptized, and then 5,000 were baptized, and the church was growing so fast, exponentially, they just stopped counting. The church was growing rapidly, exponentially, and as the church grew faster and faster and faster, the Apostle Paul and others could look down through the corridors of time, and they could see that this rapid growth was not always going to be a positive thing. And let me just make a salient comment here. Friends, the fastest growing church is not necessarily God's church. Now, there's nothing wrong with fast growth, amen? Yeah. But I remind you that a cancer grows very, very rapidly. The rapidity of growth is not itself an evidence that it is God's church, amen? Yeah. Now, in the first century, there's no question it was God's church and it was growing rapidly under the power of the apostolic preaching. But into the second and especially the third and fourth centuries, as the number of adherents was increasing, this little minuscule sect of Judaism actually swept the ancient Greco- World, and it came to the place where the preeminent religious force in the known world and Constantine of Christianity. Now, I thought possible for us to appreciate this. Imagine this little, this little, this obscure act of Judaism growing so fast, so rapidly, before fax machines, before for email that within a short century be the eminent religious force in the ancient and divided half for the sake of nations and were constantly battling one another, warring with one another and constantly to himself, how can I bring unity to him? He came up with a political scheme. Now, I say that I believe it was a political scheme. Historians still debate to this day whether or not Constantine's profession of Christianity was authentic or simply a politically motivated move. I believe it was a politically motiv motivated move. And this is what he saw. He, he said, that if he simply, if he himself professed Christianity and could bring them together, even though it's the same name, but they could retain their old identity, he could unify what he saw. His nation, his kingdom, under a nominal, under a what word? Nominal, nominal Christianity. Now, I want to go back to that slide there. Notice it here. It says, Christianity had now become popular, and a large proportion, perhaps a large majority of those who embraced it, only assumed the what? Name. Assumed the what? Name. Name. Now, think about that. I just said it was nominal Christianity. What is the root word of nominal? Name. That's exactly right. When you say you're a nominal Christian, you're saying you're a Christian in name only. And so Constantine, in this brilliant stroke of, of political expediency, he united his empire 
under the banner of Christianity. But friends, here's the point. It's not as though all those pagans became converted or even Constantine himself became converted, but they simply adopted the name Christian and retained their former pagan identity. Now, the church absolutely loved it. The church hierarchy at this time was becoming so corrupt, they loved it. They said, wow, look at all the pagans that were winning. Look at all of the pagans that were coming to church. The problem was they were not one to Christ. They were simply going to a locality, namely church. And there is some serious lessons for us to learn here today. When you, when you go there on stage and, and you put a rock band on the stage or you go 